And I think it, what, what helps too is um, the joke I say is like, don't go shoe shopping at the grocery store. Like if you're hanging out with, with sex positive people who are into sensuality and, and aren't necessarily ageists, um, and those are the people that you're making invitations to and you're not you know, pulling off some sort of unconscious or consciously creepy vibe, I think in those ways, the, the rejections either, you know, because because people who are savvy can let you down nicely too. Mm -hmm. You know, there's something to, to, to be gained from hanging out with people who, you know, done some consciousness raising. Um, and the rejection can still, on a small day, I, it kills me. Because I'm, I'm not much more than a seventh grader, really. Maybe eighth grade on a good day. No, that's a really good point. Um, so often I'll, I'll hear from people who will say, I want to have my first gay experience, but I don't want to go, you know, to some weird gay event where everyone's gay. <laughs> <laughs> or I, I really want to have a threesome. And, and so I keep going to church hoping that one day I'll meet someone who, who would be willing to try this. And I'm like, are you fucking out of your mind? <laughs> you need to go to where the kinky people are to find the people who want to have threesomes. And you have to go to things that say, gay, 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 <laughs> if you want to get laid by a homo. And the chances that you will meet some quiet, shy, timid person who is afraid of everything that wants to do this. I mean, just, you really have to think of the statistics and, and, um, and, work, and work from there. And uh, I, um, I know, you know, when, when people talk about uh, this, I'm sure this isn't you. For the most part, when I meet people who say, I don't know where to begin, I don't know how to meet people, I'm in a loveless marriage, I, you know, those kind of things, um, they haven't opened the door and walked outside. They have not gone to a destination where it could even be possible. And the, and the prison of loneliness that they're talking about, um, in most cases, has to do with that great fear of taking a chance in a new milieu um, rather than the, I mean, my God, if, if I, you know, if I said my social life was restricted to the people that went to my daughter's elementary school, I mean, are you kidding? I, I never, that would not have been the sexual hunting ground for me. A couple of exceptions, but. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful exceptions. Wonderful exceptions. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, in the back. I'm a parent of a 10 year old son, and uh, so I'm looking at the uh, area of sexual participation. Obviously, the school has been covering our wear condom and this is how the mechanics work. And then you got the utilitarian that so basically they're saying, you know, there are gay people out there, and if you're one, that's okay. But there isn't really uh, the in between of communication, negotiation, self worth, uh, all these things that, that come up from that. And, uh, you know, just in the, in the context of the uh, well, I'm going to give you the shortcut answer and then the big picture answer. The shortcut answer is you have to look at the used bookstores and find a copy of Joni Blank's A Kid's First Book About Sex. And it was free, a, available for free download on my website. Now. It is. And oh so my is the, God. So is the playbook for kids about That's sex. That's wonderful. Okay, so it's, it's a free download on Joni's website. Joni Blank's website. Then leave your browser open when your kid's around. Let me tell you and why. And then. No. And here's why. Because this book was intentionally designed, and it says right off the bat, in this very impudent way, there are other books about reproduction and disease, but this is about everything else about sex. And it's all those wonderful open-ended questions about what sexual feelings are like, what Honestly, orgasms are like, nudity. pleasure, nudity, why you get the, a tingle around a certain kind of person. You show it to adults and they practically cry because they realize, well, no one even asked me these questions. They're very childlike, but they're very, like, ageless at the same time. So I think that is something wonderful. But the other more general question is, is to have a household that's filled with books and movies and talking about the news and just dealing with the events of the day, you know, just having conversations with your son about everything and anything, and having that world be part of your home life, and having different kinds of people in your home and in your social life that they're meeting, it opens up all these questions. And they already, I mean, he's 10, he already realizes that school is kind of a strange slice of life. 
and that they're so doctrinaire about some things that seem to have limited use, <laughs> you know? And, you know, why do they have the kind of conversations they have about drugs in school? They're just awful. They're just as bad as the sex stuff. And so, you know, feel free to criticize it. He's old enough. He's 10. My God. They're very smart at 10. You can sit around and, and do a, you know, you say, oh, my God, sex ed in schools is so ridiculous. You know, and he'll be intrigued. What you have to say about that, tell him your memories of what sex ed was like when you were in school. It's so, having a, a life where you're just discussing the world, and especially, oh, this is really fun. This is one of my favorite parts of parenting as far as sex education goes. I always used to read Dear Abby and Ann Landers with my daughter, because it was right across from the comics page, and she liked to read the comics, and then she loved these people's problems. And we would talk about how would you answer it. And, you know, sexual stuff comes up. And, of course, it's a sort of G-rated version, but it definitely comes up. And at some point, she just started bringing in Dan Savage, and then she wanted to read that out loud. And, you know, what do you have to say about that? Um, they, talking about other people's dilemmas and how other people solved, you know, a sexual question will introduce these notions of pleasure and attraction and desire and how kooky sex can be sometimes. Um, that it's like... As far as I'm concerned, one of the funnest parts of parenting because you see how their their little minds are working and it's so exciting. You know, sometimes they say the most insightful things. I bet your kid has already done that more than once. I will. We've got a couple more minutes, and I'll, I'll, oh, sure. I'll, I have a final a final question. Uh -huh. <clears throat> um, and we'll and and thank you for the the kid questions because it's actually it pertains to this. If you could give if you could just you could buy you national airtime. <laughs> Go and, for it. <laughs> and you had you had five minutes or you know, oh. three things <laughs> hang on, to tell to tell younger America about sex and relationships. What oh. would you tell them? You're you're getting me in a vulnerable moment because um, this past week um, of blogger friend of mine did a series about Mr. Rogers and Mr. Rogers' neighborhood and how his underlying theory about child development and children's education had to do with being able to understand your feelings and treat yourself gently and others with compassion. And one of his most famous phrases, which, oh, just gives me the shivers thinking about what it would mean as time went on. It's remember he would always like have his little sweater on and he'd look into the camera and he'd say, I like you just the way you are. Oh my God. You know, like that was like early gay pride. That was early sexual self-acceptance. He was saying to all those kids out there and you know what they're like because they're like, I'm never going to find anyone who likes me. You know, I'm covered in acne, I'm skinny, I'm fat, I'm this, I'm that. They, you know, they're so overwhelmed that they will never find their way in the world. And older people look at them and we go, oh my God, they're so beautiful. They're so delectable and lovely and, you know, like a, a rose. But they don't know that. And so this, this giant message of, of saying, I like you just the way you are and that you and that I am I'm here for you that I'm listening to you that your sexual life is is as central as living breathing eating sleeping it's the center of who you are creatively and you can never go wrong listening to it never you know to just have that offer of friendship would would probably be a decent soundbite <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Susie. Um, so in, in closing up, I want to thank the Center for Sex and Culture for having us uh, here today. Carol's in Berlin. She shuns her love. She couldn't <laughs> be here today, and she was kind of bummed because she wanted to introduce you. Oh. Um, I want to thank you for, for coming up today from Santa Cruz and for all of, all of your work. Um, and where, for, because we'll be putting this on YouTube as well, um, where can people find you? You can always find me at uh, susiebright.com, S-U-S-I-E-B-R-I-G-H-T, and, and I, I love my email box. 
makes me happy to <laughs> see at suzybright.com. Everything flows from there, I'd say. <laughs> thank you very much. All right. And thank you guys for, for coming on today. We really appreciate it. And share it on Facebook and get it up on YouTube and tell all your friends. <laughs> Bye.